These days, the sky has become a very busy place, and pilots are not the only ones who use it. Skydiving is growing in popularity at a remarkable pace. Safety and awareness of the operations is necessary. All users of the national airspace system have the responsibility to know and understand each other's operations. The FAA recognizes the U.S. Parachute Association as the experts in all facets of parachute operations and the organization the FAA turns to for advice and counsel as it relates to Our purpose is to help you become more familiar with parachuting procedures. We'll cover pilot safety concerns and take a look at pilot as well as skydiver responsibilities. Our goal is to promote within the aviation community a better understanding of skydiving and parachute operations. Present day skydiving actually began with the life-saving necessity known as parachuting. From the late 1940s and into the 60s, a few hundred adventuresome souls acquired World War II military surplus parachuting equipment, made arrangements with willing pilots, and started jumping. The idea caught on, and clubs began forming at airports all over the country. Those pioneer parachutists shared not only the thrills, but the pain of their new pursuit. In those days, the rush and excitement came from fall a good jump was one you could walk away from. In the next few years, interest in parachuting continued to grow. But something happened in the 1960s and early 70s. Enthusiastic parachutists were doing more than just jumping and falling. They were experimenting with changes in body positions and learning how to move horizontally. After discovering the ability to move and fall relative to each other in space, it wasn't long before parachutists in a multitude of aerial formations with remarkable ease and dexterity. Soon, these energetic men and women were being called skydivers engaged in sport parachuting, or as it's currently known, skydiving. In the mid-1970s, round canopies were replaced with modern rectangular-shaped canopies. Using the aerodynamics of wing design, these semi-rigid airfoils gave skydivers more maneuverability allowing them to be more precise in their accuracy. Now, the sport of skydiving is popular the world over. With today's advanced technology, parachutes perform much like gliders, using the principle of lift rather than drag. This design allows increased freedom to maneuver and offers a high level of performance capability that brings with it the chance to develop a new range of skills. Just like pilots, skydivers come in many varieties. They range from the weekend jumper to the professional skydiver. There are those who come out once a month for the pure fun of it, and those who are serious competitors, developing new techniques, exploring new skills, and setting new records. American skydivers alone are making nearly 3 million jumps a year on or next to over 300 general aviation airports nationwide. That's almost 9,000 jumps each day, 360... When you consider this activity, along with the thousands of other users in our national airspace system, you begin to see the need for education and communication. The regulations and related information regarding skydiving and aircraft operations can be found in the following documents. Federal Aviation Regulation Part 105, Parachute Jumping. Advisory Circular 105-2, Sport Parachute Jumping. Advisory Circular 90-66, Recommended Standard Traffic Patterns and Practices for Aeronautical Operations at Airports Without Operating Control Towers. The Skydiver's Information Manual, published by the United States Parachute Association. And the FAA's Aeronautical Information Manual, or A in addition to the FAA regulations, drop zone operators like me, jump pilots, airport managers, and other aviation officials get together and agree on the key safety concerns and practical issues of sharing airports and the airspace around it. 
This is the drop zone, a landing area clear of obstacles and marked with a brightly colored windsock. In addition on this map, you'll see prohibited landing areas, which include the runway environment extending both ends of the runway and the ramp and taxiway. Each day before jumping begins, we call flight service for a weather report and winds aloft forecast. 15 to 22 knots across the route. Denver forecast 25. Skydivers are qualified to jump after they have graduated from an extensive course of instruction under the direct supervision of a qualified instructor. The courses are developed by the U.S. Parachute Association. Sky for aircraft as they perfect their exiting skills. After the skydivers have determined their spot over the ground, they climb out, then carefully let go. Skydiving instruction includes indoctrination on how airplanes use airports, and being under an open canopy offers the perfect position to view all air traffic. The C and B scene principle works for airplanes and skydivers alike. Another key to a good safe skydive is a skilled pilot at the controls of the jump plane. A jump pilot's job is to fly the skydivers to altitude as safely and quickly as possible. This is accomplished by following strict guidelines and procedures. Before any jumping takes place, the jump pilot is required to file a notum at least one hour prior to the first drop. During jump operations, jump pilots follow the same procedures as anyone else covered by part general operating procedures of the Federal Aviation Regulations. In addition, they are also required to follow Part 105, which includes the special provisions unique to parachute operations. Since jump operations generally take place in Class E airspace, the location of climb, jump, and descent areas usually remains constant. Skydiving operations with continuous activity may file a permanent notum. These areas are noted on aeronautical charts with a parachute symbol and are listed in the airport facility directory. However, all pilots are cautioned that the actual location of parachute symbols on the chart might not represent the exact location of drop zones. Rather, the symbol may have been placed on the chart in the only spot free of other markings, but is still near the drop zone or airport. Another reason to make sure you look for these parachutes is because the FSS normally will not identify permanent notums during a pre-flight pilot briefing unless that information is specifically requested. Unless you're flying into or out of an airport where skydiving is taking place, it's best to avoid overflying the airport by at least two miles while maintaining a listening watch on Unicom. That was mile high two or one minute prior to jumpers over long night. Many drop zones operate in a agreement in addition to the regulations. The airspace approved for parachute operations is normally specified in the letter of agreement with the local air traffic control facility. I land where the airport says that I can land because I want to show respect to the other pilots that are here flying and maybe they don't know that the skydivers are out in the way. Uh, they can't be expected to see everything at, at the same time. So I need to show them respect and I hope they respect me in the same way. Well, are we ready? We're ready to go. Okay. Skydivers in this aircraft wear seat belts that are fastened to the floor. It's not practical to have seats in this airplane that just takes up space and impairs the ability of the skydivers to move about the cabin with their sport parachute rigs on. We use a load chart to load the aircraft so the weight and balance Once airborne, the jump pilot begins a climb pattern to reach jump altitude while remaining in the airport vicinity. A typical climb pattern is reflected in this example, although specific procedures may vary from one airport to another. Notice the jump plane's climb pattern is designed to avoid the standard traffic pattern. 
During the jump run itself, the jump plane will be thousands of feet above pattern altitude. The location of these climb out and descent areas are determined by several factors, including winds aloft, proximity to airways, population density, and air traffic control. The skydivers, before they jump out of the airplane, they get permission from the controlling agency here to jump. There's no other aircraft in the area when they do that, any jets flying by. And the pilots in this area are warned before they jump out. Their canopies open way before they get into the traffic pattern altitude. So safety-wise, I mean, we haven't had any problems out here. To further ensure the safety of everyone concerned, all parties must understand the required and expected procedures when sharing airports and the surrounding airspace. Hi, Erica. What's happening? Oh, hi, Jeff. Well, I'm getting ready for another student. We'll probably just be practicing touch and goes. Well, great. We're going to be taking off to the east, climbing, and dropping skydivers right overhead and descending to the west. We'll be well clear of each other. Okay. Sounds good. Have a good flight. All right. Thanks. When the jump plane reaches the designated drop altitude, the pilot begins lining up to fly a jump run. This typically takes place over the designated landing area and usually into the wind. Upon uh, departure of the airport, we contact approach control. Uh, they give us radar advisories and advise us of any uh, traffic or hazards in the area. We notify approach control one minute prior to dropping skydivers. That was mile high two or one minute prior to jumpers over long line. I really enjoy flying skydivers. It uh, gets a little interesting flying the aircraft uh, slow on jump run as they're shifting around the airplane and the weight and balance is changing as they're going out the door. It also creates a lot of turbulence that uh, takes a fair amount of vigilance to keep in check. We give the skydivers a green light approximately eight-tenths of a mile before the drop zone and turn the red light on if they're eight-tenths of a mile past the drop zone to make sure that they can get back to the airport. We also make an announcement over the unicom frequency that we're dropping skydivers over the airport and give the position that the uh, skydivers will be landing on the field. Attention Longmont traffic, skydiving in progress over the Longmont Airport. Skydivers will be landing north of the runway, west of the hangars at Longmont. Approach mile high two, jumpers away. We announce jumpers away and start our descent. Approach control will follow us down basically to pattern altitude where they'll uh, give us a frequency change back to Unicom. Getting out skydivers engaged in relative work. Relative work is a term used to describe how skydivers build various formations in free fall. There are only 60 to 70 seconds of free fall available for jumpers to link up and accomplish their maneuvering. After one more visual check to make sure all the jumpers are safely away, the pilot makes a quick descent, continually scanning for other air traffic. This descent may look like some sort of aerobatics maneuver, but it's not. It is the standard descent procedure for jump pilots and well within the limitations of the aircraft. Meanwhile, jumpers have been falling at a speed of 120 miles per hour or more. Typically, it takes about one minute to descend from 10,000 feet to opening altitudes of 4,000 to 2,000 feet AGL. While in free fall, a skydiver is difficult to see, but even harder to hit since most aircraft operate horizontally and jumpers in free fall are typically traveling straight down. A jumper under canopy has about the same profile as a small single engine aircraft, but whether you're the pilot or the jumper, being alert and following the rules is always the best way to prevent a collision. Obviously, a skydiver wants to avoid airplanes as much as pilots want to avoid skydivers. It's the responsibility of everyone concerned to watch for and avoid each other. Somewhere between 4,000 to 2,000 feet AGL, the free fall portion of the skydive ends. After the parachute opens, rate of descent slows to about 1,000 feet a minute. In some cases, the opening altitudes can be considerably higher. Examples include tandem jumps, 
or canopy relative work, where there is a need to open at higher than normal altitudes. In these situations, the ATC report must acknowledge that parachutes will be opening at that higher altitude. We can do it! At uncontrolled airports, the jump pilot will call out the advisory on Unicom. Except in rare cases, skydivers open their parachutes upwind of the intended landing area. When operating at an airport, this is well above normal aircraft pattern altitudes. Landing patterns for skydivers are similar to those of an airplane. The only thing a skydiver can't do is add power. Skydivers, like airplanes, land into the wind to minimize speed and maximize flare. But because their ability to fly upwind or into the wind is limited, skydivers usually don't go very far downwind from their intended landing area. Once the skydivers have exited, the jump pilot's next concern is to make a rapid spiraling descent away from the airport. Vigilance for other traffic is very important during this maneuver. Following the descent, the pilot sets up for a safe 45 degree entry into the standard traffic pattern for landing. Long my traffic in your 76 Gulf Mike's turning final. The final item on the jump pilot's checklist is to verify that all skydivers are down, then make one more radio notification to ATC. This time to advise when all jumpers have landed. The sky is big. There's room for everyone. But especially in congested areas, it's imperative that pilots and skydivers keep an open line of communication. At every opportunity, talk to each other about what you're planning to do. As pilots, we can appreciate the energy and dedication that has taken skydiving from a survival skill to a world-class sport. As interest and participation in skydiving continues to grow, so does our individual responsibility to follow procedures and do everything possible to maintain our mutual safety. We hope this video has increased your awareness and understanding of what goes on in the world of skydiving and parachute operations. Remember, the skies are open to everyone who is willing to communicate and follow the rules for safe operations.